Propositional Logic, Part 7, Truth Tables for Arguments. So in this part, we're going to look at analyzing arguments to see whether they're valid or invalid using truth tables. So an argument is valid if and only if there's no line on the truth table in which the premises are all true, but the conclusion is false. So let's look at an example of an argument and then test it for validity using this rule or this definition of valid. Our example argument is the premise tilde parentheses p wedge q close parentheses and the conclusion therefore tilde p. So a slightly more intuitive way of putting this, um, your premise is it's false that either p or q are true and your conclusion is that therefore not p is true or that's another way of saying p is false it's false that p so to tell whether it's valid using a truth table we start by constructing a truth table we only have two simple propositions in this argument p and q so that means our truth table is going to have four rows there's has to be um, a total of four columns one for each of our simple propositions p and q and one for our two compound propositions we have one compound proposition, that's the premise, and another compound proposition, tilde p, that's the conclusion. You also notice on the truth table that there's a slash before the tilde p. The forward slash we're going to use as an indicator for therefore. It indicates a logical move or inference. We put that on the table to remind us that the second proposition is our conclusion. Also, whenever we do a truth table for an argument, we want to put our conclusion in the rightmost column. The order of the premises doesn't really matter, but it helps if the conclusion is last or furthest on the right. It helps us apply the rule for validity more clearly. So now let's fill in the truth values of our compound propositions. So we've put in our truth values below the compound propositions. You'll note the premise has two logical operators, the tilde and the wedge. We start with the wedge because it has the smaller scope. It only covers P and Q. It's bounded by the parentheses, its scope is. So the rule for the wedge is only false where both disjuncts are false. You can see that on row four. When we apply the tilde to the wedge, it just reverses or negates the truth value. So where the wedge is true, like on rows one to three, the tilde wedge becomes false. And where the wedge is false on row four, the tilde wedge becomes true. The conclusion only has one operator, uh, tilde, which just reverses the truth value of P on each of those rows. So um, we can ask ourselves, is this valid? And that's basically asking, are there any rows on which the premise is true, but the conclusion is false? Look at row one. The premise is false and the conclusion is false. There's only uh, one row in which we can test directly for validity. Row four, we have a true premise, but the conclusion is also true. So that means there's no row of the truth table with the true premise and a false conclusion. So that means, yes, indeed, it is a valid argument. So now let's look, the, look at the concept of invalidity. Invalid just means not valid. So to apply this to truth tables, in, in, in an invalid argument, there is going to be at least one line in which all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So let's look at the sample argument where we have two premises, um, not parentheses P and Q, close parentheses, not P, and our conclusion is Q. So let's assign truth values to this table. So we've assigned the truth values to our compound propositions. Our first premise, tilde parenthesis p dot q close parenthesis has two logical operators, the tilde and the dot. We have to start with the dot. It has the smaller scope. It's bounded by the parentheses. The dot is only true on row one where both of its conjuncts are true. Otherwise it's false. To calculate the truth value of the tilde, we just reverse the truth value of the proposition it negates on each row. So where that dot is true, the tilde is going to be false and vice versa. The tilde P, that's our second premise. Uh, we just reverse the truth value of P on each of those rows. So on rows one and two, P is true. So tilde P is false and vice versa for rows three and four. And then our conclusion is the simple proposition Q. So we can just copy the truth values uh, 
from the left uh, column in our truth table under Q, copy that down on our rightmost column. You'll notice that our conclusion is also on the furthest column to the right after the forward slash to remind us which of those propositions is the premises and which is the conclusion. So are there any rows of the truth table where the premises are true and the conclusion is false? The answer is yes. Row four has true premises and a false conclusion. That means the argument is indeed invalid. Now let's look at whether arguments are technically valid. A technically valid argument is one in which it's impossible for the argument to be invalid based on some property of the conclusion or the premises. There's four ways in which an argument can be technically valid. The first is in which the conclusion is a tautology. The conclusion is true on every row of the truth table. You can see in the first example of, the argu of arguments that we're giving on this slide, the conclusion is P wedge tilde P, P or not P. That's a tautology, so it's true on every row of the truth table. That means it's never going to satisfy the definition of being invalid. It's impossible to have a true premise and a false conclusion if the conclusion is never false. So we could think of that intuitively as a type of technical validity. A second way in which an argument must be valid is if it has one premise that's a self-contradiction. So that's never going to satisfy the definition of um, invalidity either, because you're never going to have a row where all the premises are true and the conclusion is false because you're never going to have a row where all the premises are true. Uh, similarly, a third way an argument must be valid is if the two premises are contradictories of each other. Once again, in order to be invalid, the argument has to have at least one row in which all premises are true and the conclusion is false. But if the premises are contradictories, there's never going to be a row where they're all true. So look at our second sample argument. The premise is P and not P, and the conclusion is therefore Q. The um, premises are contradictories of each other, and you can see that in the truth table. In every row, they have opposite truth values. So it's never going to satisfy the definition for being invalid. Therefore, it's technically valid. And then the final case is where there's two or more premises that are inconsistent. This is similar to case three, because there's never going to be a row of the truth table where both of them or all of them are true. So the only difference is that um, not all inconsistent statements are contradictory. All contradictory statements are inconsistent, but not all inconsistent statements are contradictory. So there could be uh, pairs of premises or other uh, groupings of premises where they're inconsistent. That means there's no truth row, uh, row of the truth table in which they're all true. Um, there's always at least one of them that are false, so you're never going to have a case that will satisfy the formal definition of being invalid. Okay, so now let's look at some sample problems. We're going to start with arguments in symbolic form. We're going to make truth tables of these arguments, and then we're going to um, assess the arguments for being valid or invalid. The first sample problem is where we're given the symbolic form of the argument. The second sample problem, which we'll do in a moment, is where we first are given an ordinary language version of the argument. We have to translate it into symbols. So in this case, we have two premises, tilde parentheses, tilde r dot tilde s close parentheses is our first premise. Our second premise is tilde s, and our conclusion after the slash is tilde r. So to begin with, let's construct a truth table for this argument. You can see that there are four rows of the truth table because we have two simple propositions, R and S. There are two premises and one conclusion, so that means we need three more columns of the truth table after we have the columns for the simple propositions, R and S. So we filled in all of the truth values of our premises and our conclusion. Um, to just briefly go over this, you'll notice the main operator of the first premise is the tilde, so that's in bold. Our second premise, tilde s, only has one operator, so that's going to be the main operator, and our conclusion, tilde r, also only has one operator. So to tell if it's valid, we have to see are there any rows of the truth table uh, in which we have true premises and a false conclusion? The answer is yes. If you look at row two, um, both premises are true, but the conclusion is false. So that means it's an invalid argument. If we look through each row of the table and we didn't find any rows that had true premises and false conclusion, 
then we would be able to conclude that it was in fact valid. A second example, we start with the argument in ordinary language. So first we have to translate this into symbolic form before we can create the truth table. So as a reminder, a useful tip um, is to first identify the logical operator terms as a basis for your eventual translation. So in this case, we have two different sets of logical operator terms, the either and the or, which go together, and the not. There are no other logical operator terms. So you might think at first the either or are two different logical operators, but because they're a pair, they're actually going to be translated together. The next step to create our translation is to look for the simple propositions. So the first simple proposition is you take a breathalyzer test. The second simple proposition is you get arrested for DUI. And you can see those re reoccur later on in the argument, but we have only two simple propositions. So we can um, label our simple propositions using a capital letter. Let's call the first one you take a breathalyzer test B, and the second one you get arrested for DUI D. So now we can translate the argument into symbolic form. The first premise is B wedge D. Either you take a breathalyzer or you get arrested for DUI. The second premise is tilde D. We have that negation in there for the not. And the conclusion, which is indicated by the word therefore, we indicate symbolically by a forward slash, is you do get arrested for DUI, or that's D. So now we have to create our truth table for our symbolic form of the argument. The truth table is going to have four rows because we have two simple propositions, B and D. Um, the total number of columns is going to be five, uh, two columns for our simple propositions, and then one column each for each of our premises and the conclusion. So then we have to ask ourselves, are there any rows of the truth table in which there are true premises but false conclusion? If so, it's invalid. If not, it's valid. The answer is this is a valid argument because there's no rows of the truth table in which we have true premises and false conclusion. On row three, both premises are true, but the conclusion is also true. So that means uh, taken as a whole, there's no other rows that satisfy the definition of invalid. That means the argument is valid. So the truth tables are powerful because they allow us to calculate for individual arguments whether they're valid or invalid. We can expand on the utility of the truth table by relying upon the concept of argument form. An argument form is an arrangement of logical operators and statement variables such that a consistent substitution of statements for statement variables results in an argument. What this is saying is that for each argument we look at, there's a kind of abstract or general form so we can create substitution instances or particular examples of that argument form by substituting things in for some of those propositions. But the idea is if we've proven that an argument with the general logical form is valid or invalid, we know all other substitution instances of that argument form are valid or invalid as well. So in other words, instead of looking at a particular example of an argument form or a particular example of a logical argument put into symbolic form, we can generalize to all other arguments that share that same general logical structure. So whether an argument is valid is based on its general logical form. An example of a valid argument form that's very common is modus ponens. This is from the Latin for method or mode of affirming. It's because the first premise is a conditional proposition and the second or other premise is the antecedent of that conditional. So you're saying with the other premise that the antecedent is true. You're affirming the antecedent. Here's an ordinary language example of this argument form. If you study hard, then you will get an A. You did study hard, therefore you'll get an A. So translated into symbols, we can use the letter S for the proposition you study hard and the letter A for the proposition, you will get an A. Um, so the whole proposition, the whole argument becomes S horseshoe A is the first premise. Second premise is S and the conclusion is A. 
And you'll notice there's no row of this truth table in which both premises are true and the conclusion is false. So it does count as a valid argument form. And once again, the reason why the notion of a general argument form is powerful is because any argument that shares this general form is going to be valid. First of all, we can substitute different simple propositions in for the S and the A. So no matter what capital letter we put in there, as long as we substitute it consistently, it's going to share the same logical argument form. So for example, if we had the, propos the arguments P horseshoe Q, P therefore Q, it's gonna have the same form, it's still going to be valid. And also a more complex type of substitution, which we'll talk about more when we get to um, chapter eight or the part on proofs, is that um, you can substitute in compound propositions for the simpler propositions shown here. So if we had an argument that was, for example, if P and Q then R, P and Q therefore R, it would have the same general form as modus ponens, so it would still be valid. Now let's look at an example of a fallacy, an invalid argument form. We can prove that this argument is invalid using the truth table. Um, the argument form is called affirming the consequent because it starts with a conditional, but the other premise is not the antecedent, unlike modus ponens. It's actually the consequent of that conditional. So let's look at an ordinary language example. If you study hard, then you'll get an A. You got an A, therefore you studied hard. If you're not thinking very carefully, this could sound like a valid argument. But if you look at row three of the truth table, you see both of those premises are true, and yet the conclusion is false. That means it's an invalid argument form. And once again, all substitution instances of this general argument form will also be invalid. A second very common valid argument form is modus tollens. This is from the Latin for the method or mode of denying. Like modus ponens, one of the premises is a conditional, but the other premise is a negation. It negates the consequent of that conditional, so you're denying the consequent. The ordinary language example is if you study hard, then you will get an A. You did not get an A, therefore you did not study hard. If you look at the truth table for this argument, you'll see there's no row that has true premises and false conclusion. Therefore, it is a valid argument form. There's a fallacy called the fallacy of denying the antecedent that looks a lot like modus tollens, but is actually invalid. Like modus tollens, it starts with a conditional. And like modus tollens, the other premise is a negation. However, the negation premise negates the antecedent of the conditional rather than the consequent, and that's enough to make it invalid. Let's look at an ordinary language example. If you study hard, then you'll get an A. You did not study hard, therefore you did not get an A. If you look at row three of the truth table for this argument, both of the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. That proves this argument form is invalid. 